You may be seated. And Rabbi Helfman, this is our chance to drink in your final words of Torah. Everybody in the world needs to see it, this comforter of blue that we have around us. We think, oh, that's blue sky. And then suddenly you shoot through it, all of a sudden, all of a sudden like you whip, like off, you whip a off a sheet when you've been asleep and you're looking into blackness, into black ugliness. There is mother and earth and comfort, and there is, is there death? Is that death? Is that the way death is? These are the words of a famous Canadian Jew who I idolized as a child, not because he was a Jew or because he was Canadian, but because his character boldly went where no one had gone before. At my bar mitzvah, for those of you who are invited, you may remember mingling with other guests between life-sized cardboard cutouts of Star Trek characters. Now, instead of focusing on the environmental impact of strapping yourself onto a rocket and combusting enough fossil fuels to reach orbit while the seas are rising and forests are burning, I'll save that for another sermon. I want to focus on what William Shatner realized in those seconds, literally seconds, between when his sky was blue and when it evaporated to black. In his words, what I would love to do is to communicate as much as possible the jeopardy, the vulnerability of everything. It's so small. This air which is keeping us alive is thinner than your skin. Shatner isn't the only one in the past year to feel the thinness of the skin which holds us together, the fragile network of arteries and veins, of supply chains and health, that were any of them to close, we would not be able to stand before our Creator, to feel the precariousness of the life that we have built around us. Pre-pandemic, as our children were becoming to be, were preparing to become bar, bat, or perach mitzvah here at Holy Blossom Temple, preparing to read and teach as beautifully as Lavi just did, families would sit together in small groups around tables in our Phil Smith Hall. And one of the questions we would ask would be, what cell phone apps do you use the most? Now, think for a second. What cell phone apps do you use the most? What are the top three that you click on in your daily life? I'll tell you the answer I remember from those conversations. From parents, it was the Green Pea parking app. <laughs> Facebook and email with work. As parents tried balancing their ferrying of their children around with the demands of normal life. As for the kids, it was mobile games, TikTok, and Twitter. I'll tell you which app I use the most, more than Candy Crush or Words with Friends, a Holy Blossom theme game, Temple Run. Just kidding. That's. Sorry, that was a niche audience joke. That's, uh, I apologize. Now that we've spoken a bit about apps and what priorities we have in our lives, let's shift to people. Let's take another moment and do something which all of us are afraid of at the moment, which we try not to do, which is contact tracing. If you were asked to do contact tracing today, maybe 
going back into the beginning of December, middle of Hanukkah, who were your close contacts? How much time have you spent with them? What were the stories you told? And what were the memories that you created together? While the blue surrounding us may be thin and life precarious, how do we zoom in and make this thinness matter? How can we create inside the atmosphere that we have a deep, rich, vibrant life? Inside the thin atmosphere, we know there is incredible potential, incredible depth, uncountable stories and lives. In rare moments when we have the chance to hover above the clouds and look down from above, we gain perspective both on the fragility but also on the richness of potential. There is a Hasidic idea of dvekut, of cleaving to, attaching yourself up to the divine, seeing yourself as part of the infinite. This week, our Torah portion gives us what I think is a more achievable goal, vayigash, from further away, to get the courage to approach to start moving towards bringing that infinite godliness, that infinite potential into our lives. Vayigash, as Rabbi Splansky just taught, and he approached, taking steps forward, is in fact a custom of many each time they pray the Amidah, the standing prayer. While I know that many of us classical reform Jews are against moving too much and ruining the decorum of prayer, the 12th century sage Eliezer of Worms suggests that those who do take three steps forward before the tefillah do so to walk in the ways of our ancestors, to join in their journey of courage, participating in their first steps towards a thicker and richer life as they approached the incredible. Vayigash, and they drew closer. The first Vayigash in the Tanakh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Avraham stepped forwards for justice. Will you obliterate the righteous with the wicked? From the Women's Advocacy Group, to Luke Sklar Mental Health Initiative, to refugee assistance, environmental and interfaith, this community is one which I know seeks to see the larger picture of fragility in our world. And sometimes cautiously, and sometimes boldly steps forward towards a world which is more divine. For the second, let me quote my teacher, speaking in 2018. Still, after all these years, when I enter the sanctuary for the High Holy Days, and I first lay my eyes on my congregation, they actually take my breath away, and my heart skips a beat. I see them as a whole unit, as Amcha, and I fall in love with them all over again. They are such good people. And then my eyes drift across the pews, and I see the individual faces, the individual families. I know them. I know their stories. I care about them. I admire them. I literally thank God for them. And then it is easy to join my prayers together with theirs. I know we rabbis need to be careful with what we say from this bima. There is at least one family in this congregation with four children because Rabbi Plout stood on this bima and said, have another child for the sake of the Jewish people. <laughs> True. But still I say this with confidence. You need to be here to get to meet these amazing people. We need you, like Stacy did, to stand with us as an adult and decide 
to come and read Torah. We need you, like Jeff Denneberg, to decide to keep on teaching Torah. We need you to step forward and be part of this community. Like Lavi, to ask questions and seek meaningful answers. Whenever congregants get together, I am always shocked when people don't actually all know each other in the room. The family service restarts in January in Tat Shabbat. The daily morning and evening service, the daily morning and evening services. Vayigash, draw closer. The first time you come, you may feel like an outsider. The second time, like an observer. But by the third time, when someone new comes, you will be welcoming them, showing them where the breakout room with David Gershon is, or pouring them a thimble of scotch, depending on which service you're attending. <laughs> this second Vayigash is this week's story of renewed connection, where Judah, our namesake, a changed man, a humbled man, stands before Joseph, and then Joseph responds, calling him brother. The hardest part of parting is that my eyes drift across these pews, across my recent inbox. My eyes wander, and I see such good people, families and individuals. Like my teacher, Rabbi El Splansky, I fall in love with them. And the third Vayigash are the words of a prophet tying the present to the past, Eliyahu Hanavi, worshiping before God and reminding God the names of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Elijah the prophet could seek to draw close to God based on his own merits, but he does not. He ties himself into the long chain of Jewish tradition from Abraham to Israel, from Moses to Sandy Koufax, William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, and Drake. My first desk here at Holy Blossom was Rabbi Plout's desk. My senior rabbi then sat in Rabbi Plout's old office, the old library. I've stood where Rabbi Feinberg stood, where Eisendraff, who then walked next to Dr. to Dr. Martin Luther King, has stood. In fact, there on the upper bima, where Rabbi Splansky stood this morning, so many, so many luminaries of our movement and humanity have stood. From the boards, to the lay leaders, to the regulars, to the irregulars, you know who you are. From the teachers and their students and the students of their students, we can draw closer to God when we recognize what was before, who stood before us, and honor them, realizing the schut, the merit of our teachers. And that merit gives us the courage to step forwards, gives us the worth to be who we are. If I name people, I of course will offend people, but still I must name a few. David Gershon, Mark Weinstock, Benny Meisner, Noam Katz, Rabbis Goodman, Tomasho, Satz, Appleby, Moskowitz, Marmer, Tepper, Lindy Rivers, David Rosen. Nice musical selection today, by the way. It was, uh, <laughs> it was kind of a little all over the place, but, uh, but the Judy Gershon Kedusha was especially beautiful. Thank you. The presidents of this synagogue, its boards and committees, the pulpit committee, the recent past president of Artsenu, Joan Garson, the board members of the World Union, including its president, Carol Sterling, the president of the Women of Reform Judaism, Sarah Charney, and of course, Rabbi Yael Splansky. Think of those whose footsteps you stand in Honor them through telling their stories and sharing their words. As we enter our Amidah on Sunday morning, the next time that you come to pray with us as a community, online or in person, 
think of the three steps forward that you will take, physically or mentally, for justice, for our community, for continuity of tradition. As I stand on the shoulders of those who are proud to say we preach prophetic Judaism, I want to end today with the last words of our Haftarah, which Alberto so beautifully chanted. When we talk about prophetic Judaism, we often think of how we draw near to heal our world, social justice. But the prophets also talk about God drawing closer to us, to our sacred selves, if we allow it. Our Haftarah today ended with a play on Vasuli Mikdash Vishakanti Bitocham, make me a sanctuary that I might dwell inside of you. Our Haftarah ended, Vicharti Lahem Brit Shalom, Brit Alom, Brit Olam, Vnatati et Mikdashi Bitocham Le Olam. I'll make a covenant of friendship, a covenant of peace with you. It shall be an everlasting covenant. I will establish and multiply and I will place my sanctuary inside of you forever. My presence shall dwell with you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. The infinite dwells without, but also too within each of us. Surrounding you today are some of the best people, each a place where the infinite infinite complexity, infinite glory of God is contained. Let each of us treat our fellows as dwelling places of the divine, accepting and welcoming them and helping them find a place, feeling that they are an integral part woven into our community. And inside of each of us, we can also find the indwelling presence of the eternal if only we get the courage to approach it for justice, for community, and to link us to what was before. This air, which keeps us alive, is thin, thinner than your skin. But beneath it, life is deep, complex, connected. And so, in close orbit, we draw near to our heritage, to our teachers, we strive to draw near to sacred community, each person around you, a sanctuary where God dwells. In these past eight and a half years, I have sought to draw us all closer to each other and to a world built on justice. And I hope I have succeeded a tiny bit to enrich the long and storied history of this sacred community. By Yigash, we draw near to one another and now that the time of parting has come from this community which I love, I pray that the connections will remain strong. May we always draw near to God and to one another. See you at a future World Union Connections Conference. And dear friends, I look forward to hosting you in London. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.